Welcome to science class. Today we will be discussing Earth's past, but this time we are taking a look at life, not geology. Except it's still geology because we are looking at fossils, whatever. In this video, you will learn what fossils are, how organisms become fossilized, and the different kinds of fossils. Then we will discuss how the fossil record is proof that Earth has changed slowly over time, as opposed to a relatively young Earth, which has always looked as it does today, and whose life forms have always been here and have not changed. If you remember from last time, the work of Nicholas Steno and James Hutton pioneered the idea that layers of rock, which we call strata, preserve different episodes in Earth's history. And the fact that there are layers is evidence that a record of those natural processes builds up one at a time, very slowly. Amongst those layers are fossilized organisms. Long before Charles Darwin wrote his masterpiece on the origin of species, it was already understood that the fossil record recorded transitions, or at least changes, to the types of plants and animals on Earth. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. First up, how does one become fossilized? Let's get started. This is a fossilized ammonite shell. Ammonites are an extinct type of mollusk. Now, how much of the original shell do you suppose remains? To tell you the truth, virtually none. The way we think about fossils is broken. This is not a fossilized trilobite. It's just in the shape of a trilobite. Apart from a specific class of fossils, which we will cover later, all fossils are made of minerals. They are completely inorganic. A fossil is a rock in the shape of a living thing. So how do organisms become fossilized? Step one, die. Step two, when you die, die in a protective environment, buried and hidden away from other organisms that will break down your whole body, including your bones. Mud is probably the best place to die if you want a molding of your skeleton to be stared at by future organisms. Step three, have a skeleton, an exoskeleton, or a shell. This will increase the chances that your body creates a cavity as the mud surrounding you turns into sedimentary rock. Fossils are sedimentary rocks, specifically, and fossils can only be found within sedimentary rock layers. Technically, fossils are chemical sedimentary rocks. The mineral structure forms out of solution, but fossilization can take place within the tissue of the organism as well. If we look at wood under a microscope, you can see it's very porous. Mineral-rich water can seep into these pores and then begin precipitating. This large piece of petrified wood formed that way. There's no more wood left. There's nothing but minerals, which is why it is so colorful and so heavy. But the wood, which the mineral-rich water soaked into, is the reason it looks just like wood. Just look closely at the texture. It's unmistakable. This is not the only way that fossils are created, but it is the most common way. A fossil that is in the shape of, or very close to the shape of the original organism, or part of it, we call that a cast. Sometimes the organism leaves an impression of its body, like when you press a seashell into Play-Doh. That is called a mold. But plenty of organisms don't have skeletons or any hard body parts. These organisms don't form casts, but they do sometimes create molds. I have a mold of a leaf. You can clearly see how the leaf left impressions in the mud, which then became fossilized. Another way to fossilize soft-bodied organisms is through carbon films. When the organism's body is compressed in layers of sediment, the carbon that made up its tissue can become imprinted into the rock around it. This preserves a wonderful outline of the shape of the organism. Here I have a tiny little fish, which is both a mold and a carbon film. You can see where its bones are embedded into the rock, but also the outline of its body and fins. Insects, jellyfish, leaves, and other organisms sometimes fossilize this way. Now take a look at this. This is not really a fossil. It's what you call a preserved remain. The whole animal is here or at least all of its tissues. We have found several frozen mammoths, woolly rhinos, frozen lion cubs, and frozen people. Utzi, the Iceman, was found in 1991. 
His remains were preserved in a mountain glacier for at least 5,100 years, perhaps as many as 5,400 years. When Utsi was alive, woolly mammoths still walked the earth. Utsi was so well preserved that his DNA has been tested, his stomach contents were analyzed, we found tattoos all over his body, we MRI scanned him to see that he had arthritis, and so much more. Other organisms become trapped in tree sap, which then crystallizes into amber. We have found insects, spiders, amphibians, plants, lizards, feathers, and recently, part of a theropod dinosaur tail with intact feathers have all been found trapped in amber. The bones found in the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles are preserved remains as well. While the bone tissue is saturated with bitumen, those really are the actual bones of those animals. Finally, there are trace fossils. These are not the direct remains of the organism, but instead a trace of what it left behind. Dinosaur footprints can be found in Utah and Colorado. Those are trace fossils. Fossilized tunnels that animals dug have been found, and we also find dinosaur turds. Coprolites are lumps of rock that look exactly like, well, look at them. So how do we use the fossil record to interpret Earth's past? Do fossilized organisms even have the ability to tell us about the past? A lot of people say no, but a lot of people are wrong. For one thing, fossils can tell us how environments on our planet have changed. This fossilized sea turtle called Archelon was found near Pierce, South Dakota, well over a thousand miles from the ocean. If you travel to the Geology Museum in Rapid City, South Dakota, you will see 10 meter long aquatic reptile fossils that were found in the area as well. These kinds of fossils can be found here because this part of North America during the Cretaceous period was underwater. When the Rocky Mountains were uplifted, so was the middle of the continent and this seaway drained away. Apart from that, fossils also show us that life, along with Earth's surface, has progressed through changes. The fossil record clearly demonstrates that entire genres and phyla of types of animals and plants gradually appear and sometimes suddenly go extinct, as with what happened to the dinosaurs. But organisms don't suddenly appear. There are gaps in the fossil record, of course, but we have been closing those gaps with new discoveries for a few centuries now. We will return to that in a little bit, but let's back up. Remember, sedimentary rock layers, where we find fossils, are deposited one at a time, and the oldest layers are found on the bottom. This trilobite fossil, Nowhere on Earth can you find these mixed among the fossils of dinosaurs, nor can you find them in layers above dinosaurs. And we have found millions of trilobites and dinosaurs, so the data is solid. So what does that mean? Well, it can only mean that trilobites and dinosaurs never coexisted on the planet. Trilobites went extinct a long time before dinosaurs ever evolved on Earth. How about dinosaurs and brontotheres, an ancestor of rhinos? Are their remains ever found together? No. There were very small mammals around during the Mesozoic era, sure, but none of the modern types of mammals, or any type of modern animal, or some of the more recently extinct animals, have ever been found fossilized alongside dinosaurs. Now there are what we call living fossils. Horseshoe crabs date back 445 million years, but that is not evidence that all life on Earth has been around that long. Millions upon millions of fossils have been documented, and in all those millions of samples, not one time have two fossils been found together that don't belong together. This was well understood before Charles Darwin proposed the theory of evolution. Geologists and serious scientists had already come to terms with the fact that the fossil record clearly contradicts any notion of a sudden creation of life. Life instead progressed through a series of stages and patterns, gradually building the species we find today, and virtually all species alive today did not exist in the past. The principle of fossil succession is an observation in geology where the fossil record shows us that organisms succeed each other in a definite and determinable order. This principle was proposed right at the turn of the 1800s, over a century before we had the technology to actually date rocks to specific ages, 
but we could still clearly tell that certain organisms never coexisted on our planet because their fossils were never found together. In simplest terms, what is observed in the fossil record is that organisms gradually transition from simple to more complex and life began in the oceans and gradually transitioned to land. Then some animals, plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, ichthyosaurs, cetaceans, and pinnipeds evolved and went back into the seas. But you can clearly see that they transitioned into the water from land by studying the fossil record. The oldest fossils on the planet are what we call stromatolite fossils. Stromatolites still exist today, and they are found in tropical shallow waters. I have a polished stromatolite fossil right here. This is actually a trace fossil. If you cut open a stromatolite fossil, you see that it has a layered structure. This is built by microbial mats of cyanobacteria, photosynthetic prokaryotes. They live as a colony of goop on top of the formation, and as they take in nutrients and metabolize them, they excrete waste. That waste builds up and forms these mineral structures. The oldest stromatolite fossils are up to 3.7 billion years old. You cannot find fossils of complex multicellular organisms that are that old, not even close. Those forms of life evolved later. Let's examine some of the oldest known fossil animals. This is Dickinsonia, don't laugh, and it dates back over 550 million years. Now what makes an animal an animal is they are multicellular eukaryotes with an internal digestive system. That's it. Notice how I didn't say that they must have eyes or legs or anything like that. So if we just allow ourselves to imagine, okay, what would something look like that only fits the three definitions of an animal? Multicellular, eukaryotic, internal digestive system. Well, Dickinsonia fits the model pretty well. Its body is just nothing but repeating segments. This animal has a front and a back, and it probably preferred to move in a certain way, but there's no face, there's no mouth, no anus, no eyes, no specialized organs at all. This animal comes from a period known as the Ediacaran. All animals from this period are invertebrates and possess almost no specialized features. They couldn't even see. They are extremely simple. And as we fast forward, we run into gradually emerging complexity. Around 540 million years ago, at the beginning of the Cambrian period, we see animals begin to incorporate minerals into their bodies. First in the form of exoskeletons and shells, then internal skeletons later on. Chordates appear, which are the ancestors of true vertebrates, such as all fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. Arthropods evolved during this period, which are the ancestors of crustaceans, insects, myriapods, and arachnids, and isopods. From the early stages of the Cambrian period to the end of the Devonian, 359 million years ago, the emergence of most recognizable types of animal traits emerge. Eyes, mouths, predatory appendages, true jaws that open and close, gills, armored defenses, internal skeletons, lungs, limbs, and more. We begin to find what are called transitional species throughout these periods. One of the most well-known is Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik lived around 375 million years ago. Tiktaalik was a fish, but it had many non-fish-like traits. Tiktaalik had a neck, so it could move its head independently of its torso. Tiktaalik's fins also had bones, which are only seen in the uncommon lobe-finned fishes today. Tiktaalik, in fact, has an entire shoulder and clavicle bone structure, which no living fish today has. Tiktaalik also had a flattened amphibian-like head. Tiktaalik possesses many primitive features that would later become slightly modified over the generations, leading to true tetrapods. All land-dwelling vertebrates and their descendants are tetrapods, or in other words, all mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds. We are all related to this one animal. Amphibians are the link between Tiktaalik and other tetrapods. Amphibians live part of their life in the water and part of their life on land, so it makes perfect sense. Amphibian fossils appear earlier in the fossil record than any other kind of tetrapod, much earlier, in fact. Tiktaalik was not discovered until 2006. The next transitional fossil we will cover in detail was found in Charles Darwin's time, 
and he actually predicted that a fossil of this type would be found, which is quite the prediction. The specimen I am talking about is Archaeopteryx. Birds branched off of the theropod dinosaur suborder, making them most closely related to raptors and Tyrannosaurus rex. So we should expect to see a transitional species which possesses both dinosaur and primitive bird traits. If we look at the skeleton of a Velociraptor, we see a particular hip structure. These three bones, the ilium, ischium, and pubis, all have this kind of orientation in theropod dinosaurs. Modern birds have a sort of backwards facing pelvis. Archaeopteryx has a theropod dinosaur pelvis, but also asymmetrical wings like modern birds. We're not sure how well Archaeopteryx could fly, but it could definitely glide pretty well. Now there's tons of resistance to this for some reason, but raptors like Velociraptor had feathers, get over it. Gradually, we start to see the dinosaur traits disappear from these evolving birds. The toothy snout of Archaeopteryx was replaced by a beak. The independently movable fingers, which Archaeopteryx had, were replaced by fused fingertips, apart from some of the flightless birds. The pelvis changed, the tailbone shrank to nothing more than a stub, and so on. We have fossils of birds that have totally modern skeletons, apart from the fact that they still have teeth. But like I said, that trait eventually disappeared completely. There are so many examples of transitional forms. We have ancestors of manatees slowly losing their hind legs, which we also see in whales. Ancient snake fossils with shrinking legs are known. Ichthyosaurs from the Jurassic period clearly show a transition where they became more and more specialized for the water with a growing tail fluke and dorsal fin. We also have transitional fossils of you and me. There have been many hominid species that have gone extinct. Homo sapiens are the only one that are still around. The more famous ones are Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo ergaster. But a few years ago, a specimen which came to be known as Homo naledi was found in Africa. Homo naledi's remains are interesting for a few reasons. Now, of course, our more ancient primate ancestors were arboreal. They were adapted for life in the trees. When we look at the bone structure of arboreal primates, we see that their finger bones and toe bones have quite a curvature to them. Take a look at this orangutan finger, for example, compared to a human's. Now we're not 100% sure how the environment changed for our ancient ancestors. Some hypotheses are that the rainforests gradually disappeared in Africa, forcing us to spend more of our time walking on land than being in trees. But what is clear is, first of all, our ancestors were arboreal. Second of all, we became bipedal much later. Homo naledi's bone structure shows a foot, hip, and lower leg bone structure that is so modern that it's almost indistinguishable from modern humans today. However, Homo naledi's finger bones still have a lot of curvature to them. Homo naledi was spending almost all of its time walking around on the ground. So the leg bones had to be adapted for that lifestyle. There was less environmental selective pressure on the hands to change. So that trait changed more slowly. But again, we have a transitional form with modern traits, the modern hip and leg bones, and more primitive traits, the curved finger bones of our more ancient ancestors. What I want you to take away from this is that fossils show that life wasn't created all at once. Much like studying layers of sediment shows us that Earth's geological features weren't created all at once either. This isn't a biology course, so we will not be expanding that much on the theory of evolution. This video is meant to partially illustrate what evolution, or what Darwin actually called it, descent with modification, is or looks like. One of the most important contributors to influencing Darwin was Charles Lyell, especially his book, Principles of Geology. Darwin read this and understood that Earth goes through phases where features are built up, but also torn down. Darwin studied a huge range of fossils on his voyage on the Beagle, almost all of which were of strange and oftentimes gigantic mammals that did not exist on this planet anymore. He wondered, do creatures that go extinct leave no trace in the modern world? Or does the diversity of life today 
owe its features to more ancient ancestors. That turned out exactly to be the case. On May 3rd, 1860, which is my birthday by the way, Lyell wrote in a letter to a friend, Mr. Darwin has written a work which will constitute an era in geology and natural history to show that the descendants of common parents may become, in the course of ages, so unlike each other as to be entitled to rank as a distinct species from each other or from some of their progenitors. Well put, Mr. Lyell. Next time, we'll be discussing how studying the atom and understanding radioactivity gave birth to radiometric dating, the technique that allowed us to finally answer the question of how old Earth actually is. Thanks for watching.